Thank you. Um, hi, so uh, I'm Guillermo. I'll be talking about optimal routing for constant function market makers. I think most people here probably have an idea of what optimal routing means, but um, maybe you have an idea of what constant function market makers mean. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so this is work done jointly with uh, Alex Evans from uh, Bank Capital Crypto, Tarun, who's right there, so blame him if there are any problems with the presentation, uh, any typos especially. Uh, and then uh, Stephen Boyd, who's at Stanford University, oh, and Tarun is at Gauntlet. Um, cool. So I guess with that, uh, let's do a quick overview. Hopefully this, it seems like it's, uh, I might just have to use the arrows. Okay. So uh, of decentralized exchanges, so, so they're also called DEXs. So decentralized exchanges essentially are these venues which you can use for exchanging you know, assets on chain, right? Uh, so uh, in particular, decentralized exchanges, the, the point is that they require no intermediate party to kind of like, you know, uh, facilitate the transaction. That's why they're called decentralized. And in particular, these decentralized exchanges are the main venue for trading assets uh, on blockchains. So blockchains such as, for example, Ethereum or Solana. Um, one thing to note, actually, is that uh, these DEXs, as, as they're you know, called, as the cool kids call them, uh, actually trade about billions of uh, dollars per day. So I, I looked it up this morning, and I think you know, saw V3, which is the largest on a, one of the largest centralized exchanges on Ethereum, did about 800 million uh, in the last 24 hours. So, okay. So um, usually, actually, what we find is these centralized exchanges uh, are organized as a very specific type of automated market maker called a constant function market maker, or a, or a CFMM. So uh, the high-level idea behind CFMMs is, you know, essentially anybody can go up to the CFMM and say, here, I, I want to perform this trade. I want to trade this basket of tokens for this other basket of tokens. And the CFMM is just going to take the, those proposed baskets, check them against some simple rule. That's usually a simple computational rule. Uh, and then accept or reject based on whether that rule, that, you know, proposition evaluates to true. And the point is, if a trade is accepted, then essentially what happens is the CFMM takes the baskets of tokens that the trader is proposing to tender to the CFMM, uh, and then pays out the, the amount that the, the trader has proposed to receive. So uh, in math parlance, essentially, any CFMM can trade a basket of n tokens. Uh, the behavior is mathematically defined by two things, one of which is called a trading function, which is this function that takes the non-negative n vectors to real numbers, and its reserves. So reserves are essentially piles of tokens that the market has available to it from which it either pays or receives tokens to. Um, and this is also itself a, non, a vector of uh, a non-negative n vector. Uh, as I mentioned before, anybody can propose a trade. Um, we're gonna call this uh, delta and lambda. So the delta here are the tendered tokens. So they're the tokens that the person is wants to you know, give to the CFMM. And then lambda are the received tokens, which are those which are uh, you know, proposed to be received by the person who is proposing the trade. And the rule is very simple, essentially a CFMM will accept the trade if the function evaluated on you know, r plus gamma delta minus lambda is greater than or equal to uh, p of r. I'll explain what this means in a second, actually, give an intuitive interpretation. But the point is, if this rule is true, then what happens is the CFMM takes, uh, you know, pays out lambda to the user. So lambda is a vector of n tokens and pays it out to the user and then receives delta from the user. So, that's, so if it evaluates to true, this is accepted, and then the user has performed this trade, which is defined by these deltas and lambdas. Uh, and then the new reserves, of course, if you kind of like do the accounting out, right, is the CFMM receives delta from the user, so the reserves add delta, and then subtract out lambda, which is what the user has proposed to tender to the CFMM. Um, so this also gives us a, a nice interpretation for the inequality here. So the inequality here is, uh, says evaluate the, the, the function on the new reserves with the input basket discounted by a factor of gamma, right? So we can see gamma in some sense as a trading fee. Right, the, the CFMM receives more than it actually evaluates the function on. So therefore, you know, intuitively, that means that we have, you know, it receives a percentage higher than, it, than like, actually it gives out to the user. Okay, so there are many examples of trading functions. Uh, probably the most common is, if, which is used by Uniswap v1 and v2, and in some sense v3, but in a weird complicated way, is called the constant product market maker. Um, so actually, if you had come up with this equation back in, uh, around mid-2018 and you had put it on chain, you'd probably be a billionaire right now. Um, unfortunately for most of us, this wasn't recognized until far later. But uh, yeah, so this is a very, very common and popular, I, I would say by far the most common uh, such trading function. Uh, and then there's of course more, you know, other weird generalizations. So uh, an example generalization from this kind of two token case to the n token case is called the geometric mean market maker, which simply takes the weighted geometric mean with weights w. Uh, but there are many, many others. And in fact, they can be actually quite complicated. Uh, so 
the point is here, we just have some trading function. We're only going to treat it as an abstract object. And the, actually, what we're going to do is we're only going to use one major property of this function, which is that the trading function phi is actually concave. So weirdly enough, this is like, you know, usually when someone tells you, oh, this thing is concave, you, if someone comes up to you in the street and tells you that, you'd be like, okay, this is like a magical special case that just turned out to be right. But actually, it turns out in practice, this is uh, almost universally the case on, on chain decentralized exchanges. Um, so there are, of course, other natural generalizations. So you don't actually have to consider trading functions at all, in fact. But uh, we can get to those later, um, hopefully at a, on a whiteboard as opposed to a talk. Cool. Okay. So now we're going to talk about, you know, I've been saying, okay, great. This is optimal routing for constant function market makers. Talk about the constant function market maker part. Let's talk about the optimal routing part. This is, I'm about to introduce a little bit of mutation, so I apologize, but uh, I think it'll be worth it in the end, uh, I guess, depending on who you are. But, okay. So, first of all, why the hell do we care about routing, right? Um, you know, like you could say, oh, look, I just want to trade A for B. All I do is I just put it on an exchange. So, first things first, on, even on a specific chain, there's actually many CFMMs, not just one. And in fact, not only are there many CFMMs, like on the orders of thousands of tens of thousands, but in fact, actually, they overlap in the tokens that they actually like, are allowed to trade. So, for example, let's say, you know, I want to trade some token A for some token B, right? The obvious thing to do would be, okay, let's go through all of the CFMMs, which trade token A for token B, and find out which one gives me the most for whatever I'm trying to put in. Um, but how about, you know, other paths, right? Like, what if I trade token A for token C and then token B? Or token A for token D and token B? Oh, crap. And what about if I can split it across all three of them? Like, things get very complicated very quickly, right? And this kind of, if you're not careful, has a taste of this, like, exponential, like, blow up. Uh, you know, if you just look at it naively, you're like, oh, crap. Like, am I going to have to do crazy search things? You know, things get very, very complicated very quickly if you just kind of think about it in this just, you know, very general sense. Okay, so the usual trick uh, that I would say actually is almost cheating is let's write it as an optimization problem and then see if we can turn it into a form that we can solve in some useful sense. So here's where I introduce notation. So again, slight apologies, but hopefully it'll be worth it. So we're here, we're gonna have not just one CFMM, in fact, we're gonna have a network of CFMMs and we're just gonna label them one through M. Uh, and the index I will be fixed, so here, whenever I talk about I, I talk about a CFMM specifically. Uh, and the network will also have n tokens. So there are, there, you know, there's possibly many tokens, right, in this entire network. You know, all of them, let's say, are labeled one through n in this like kind of universal index. So when I talk about token, whatever three, I'm talking about token three in the entire network of CFMMs. Some CFMMs might trade that token, some might not, but uh, there is like this global labeling that we're interested in. Every CFMM will then trade a subset, which we're going to call, uh, you know. Of, of ni of the token. So ni obviously is less than or equal to n because it can't trade more than there are available to the network. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to define exactly how the subset connects to the big global set in a second. But the point is, uh, every CFMM is also kind of, as I mentioned before, defined by some trading function, right, which we're going to index by i. Uh, and this one maps, you know, the non negative ni vectors to the real numbers, some phi, gamma i, and then some reserves, uh, ri, which are also themselves non negative ni vectors. Okay, so as I did before, same thing, same notation applies, just extra indices. So we'll write delta i and for lambda i for the trade. So delta i is how much uh, you know, I give to, to CFMMI and lambda i is how much I receive from CFMMI. And so the combination is called a trade. And then what we're gonna have is we're gonna introduce these weird matrices AI. So the idea is if I were to net out how much I am receiving from the CFMM and how much I am tendering, that's lambda i minus delta i in the local indexing of the CFMM. Remember, the CFMM trades less tokens, potentially, than the, than the actual network. So we're gonna create these matrices AI, but all they do is they map these local indices to the global indices. So there's a very large, sparse vector of you know, tokens, which are kind of available to the entire network. AI simply maps the dense local indices to the sparse vector of global indices. Okay, and then the next thing to do is, okay, well, you know, I as a trader, I don't care about the individual trades, right? I only care about what I get out at the end of this. So I, I do a bunch of trades, whatever they are, I get something out. And that something is, is this psi, which is simply the sum of all of the net trades of, over the entire network in the global indexing. So in this big, you know, potential network of tokens, hopefully it's sparse, it might not be. But the point is, uh, you know, there is like these, this psi is an n vector denoting how much of all of the tokens in this global indexing I am getting out or receiving 
So psi i tells me how much of token i of the network I am giving or receiving. It is positive if I am receiving some amount from the network after performing all the trades, and it is negative if I am tendering tokens to the network after performing all the trades. Okay. So this, now finally, after introducing all of this, lets us set up what's called the optimal routing problem. So the optimal routing problem is maximizing some utility. Our utility, of course, only, I don't really care about how I'm trading. I only care about how much I get out after the fact. Uh, depends only on this kind of this, this network trade vector, right? So this vector of all the tokens that I'm either tendering or receiving, independent of what trades happened. Psi, of course, is you know exactly as written. It's a constraint on psi, which is simply that it's a sum of all of the local trades uh, in the global indexing. And then we simply have the fact that the delta i's and lambda i's had better satisfy the equations that the CFMMs uh, require them to satisfy, right? So this is just a very simple problem that all it says is, look, I care about this big, you know. Uh, set of trades, I only care about kind of the net set of trades over the network. How do I perform the trades, delta i, lambda i, in order to maximize my utility? And here, the utility u is a function mapping n vectors to uh, the real numbers, actually uh, the extended real numbers. So here, I denote negative infinity as values which I am uh, infinitely sad about, right? So in other words, they're, they're what people usually call constraints. So anything that's, that evaluates negative infinity means that I would literally rather do anything else. Okay, uh, and so the point is actually if the utility function u is concave, which actually almost universally it is for all the things we care about, then the problem is convex, right? Essentially why? Because we're maximizing a concave function subject to a bunch of linear equalities and inequalities. And then remember that I said that these phi's, these phi i's are concave, right? So a concave function greater than or equal to a constant yields a convex set. So that is a convex problem, okay? So what are some example utility functions? I claimed, look, these are kind of the, all of them are concave. Well, so if we have private valuations of individual tokens given by C, then a pretty classic utility function is take the inner product of my private valuations with all of the tokens. Another one is liquidating a basket of assets. So if I have a asset bas basket of assets delta in, uh, then I want to liquidate them to a given token J, right? So uh, here, essentially, U of J is, says maximize psi J, and I here is an indicator function that is zero if the condition inside of the parentheses is met, and negative infinity otherwise. Same thing happens as optimal arbitrage, which means uh, I don't want to tender any tokens into the network, but I want to receive the maximal amount out subject to my private valuation. And you could have pretty complicated things like the Markowitz mean type, uh, or sorry, Markowitz portfolio style optimization problems, where I want to trade assets in order to kind of maximize some, some Markowitz style utility. Okay, so fine, we talked about the problem. So what about the properties of the problem, right? This is kind of the traditional thing to do is we talk about a problem, we wanna talk about like what, what it means. So first things first, the problem is convex, which means that actually, roughly speaking, for most things that we care about, it's easy to solve in practice. Uh, so for moderately large n, where n can be here you know, in the thousands, and moderately large m, where m is in the tens of thousands, it's actually an easy problem to solve. I can solve it in under a second on a common laptop. So the problem also lends itself very nicely to general decomposition methods. So you can decompose these things to kind of get very trivially parallelizable algorithms across all CFMMs, and so you can get even faster and you know, better uh, solutions as needed. Uh, and so in order to see that, actually there's additional work with Theo Diamandis from um, MIT, uh, see an open source Julia package, which is called CFMMrouter.jl. Okay, so what I will say is, remember we was talking about this exponential blow up, even though it's convex, this problem actually has very non-trivial kind of solutions. Like the solutions are not obvious, right? If I kind of came up to you and told you this, you'd be Pretty surprised that this was optimal. So uh, here on the left-hand side, you know, so the objective is to liquidate you know, some amount T of token one for token three. So on the left-hand side, we have CFMMs. We have edges which connect CFMMs to which tokens they trade. Uh, and then the edges are essentially dashed if, the CFM, if you will actually not trade with that CFMM. They are red if you are tendering tokens into that CFMM, and they are blue if you're receiving tokens. So at T equals zero, all we're saying is we, we want optimal arbitrage, right? We want to receive the maximum amount of token three while tendering nothing to the network. At, you know, and then you can see that kind of one CFMM tenders and then the other one receives, and so you have this kind of cycle where you, if you net out everything, you end up with positive amounts of tokens without actually putting anything in the network. Um, so if you do, if you want to trade 20, actually some of the cycle directions reverse, right? So now actually you trade with both of them, but you trade with both of them in the same direction. And then if you trade with uh, T equals 50, then you get actually fairly complicated results where you're tendering to some CFMMs, some CFMMs are actually tendering to other CFMMs and then themselves receiving stuff. Right, so it like, looks like very combinatorial, very weird, but it turns out because it's convex, we can easily solve it. Okay, 
Uh, and so there's this notion of general optimality conditions. I won't talk about them super, I'll very quickly talk about them, but the point is, you know, if you write out your Lagrange multipliers, take your gradients, you do all you, your vegetables, you do everything right, uh, you know, you come out with this very nice, uh, or very nice, uh, quasi nice uh, set of inequalities, potentially say something like, the gradients of the phi i's individually must themselves be within a factor of gamma up to a constant multiple of the super gradient, or in other words, the gradient of, uh, of u at zero. So, and then these gradients of the phi i's are, can be interpreted as the marginal prices of the, of the individual markets. So if we apply this to the no arbitrage condition, actually here that plus sign should be in minus sign, that's on Tarun, um, then we can apply the same condition from before, so in this case, there exist you know, non-negative multipliers such that essentially the prices are within a factor of gamma of these like global, kind of these Gs, these global market clearing prices, right? So in other words, we say like there's no arbitrage when all of the, net, all of the individual CFMMs are themselves within some bounds of the kind of this global network price. Uh, so the idea is kind of a similar to a market clearing price or things like that. The idea is it's consistent with all of the CFMMs prices as given. Um, you can derive more general first order you know, conditions, so not just for delta i and lambda i equal to zero, and I would recommend looking at the paper for more examples. Um, cool, okay, so the point of, uh, you know, the problem is usually easy, so that's great, and this, the fact that it's easy can be used to great effect in practice. Actually, I suspect many shops are, are doing this. In fact, actually, I know some shops are actually doing exactly this. Uh, and the point is that convexity implies good computational properties and interesting mathematical properties for these like weird combinations of CFMMs. Um, cool, and then I'd like to quickly acknowledge Theo for doing the very, very first pass of these slides and for also uh, helping out with uh, software implementations. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then, uh, so again, while we're taking questions, can the last speaker come up and steal the microphone? And then Guillermo can steal the microphone. Awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks for the interesting talk. So, thank you. Uh, oh, thanks for the interesting talk. So, uh, if I understand correctly, so you're taking this uh, static model, uh, this model is actually, right? That's right. Uh, so however, I have, I have to concern, I wonder how robust this model uh, would be affected. The first, the first, say, you know, these markets are pretty volatile, and you, if you go to the stacks, there is a slippage, you, you ask for slippage tolerance. So basically, uh, maybe, and also we have, as we, the previous two talks, we have seen there's block time, so it's, these, these ex, uh, right. transactions cannot be executed uh, instantaneously, so, so they might. They actually can, yeah. um, oh, so, so the, okay. the question was essentially, um, you know, like this, isn't, this is, seems to be a static model, right? We have these reserves that are fixed and we have these fees that are fixed. Question is how does it actually happen in practice? So actually in practice, uh, Ethereum lets you execute all transactions instantaneously. Mm -hmm. They're executed atomically. So at every point in time when you know what the reserves are, you can actually execute all of the trades atomically. There are cases in which you can't, which is fine too. So this is like, for example, across different chains, if you're trading across CFMMs mm -hmm. across many chains, you could actually have weirder things too where different trades fail. But in, in Ethereum and similar ecosystems, actually, all, your transaction gets executed, executed atomically, and it either goes all together at once or it fails at some so point, that, and the entire that, thing reverts. That means you count for the loss if the certain transaction fails, the uh, gas fee or chance, uh, you pay it, right? That's right. So obviously, this is not going to be. Uh, uh, um, but so this next issue, and you should read the paper. Yeah, the, the second point is that, uh, is that you will utilize the, the, the same pool multiple times. Then the, when you utilize the set, you, when you do the transaction second time, it's the, you know, the, I saw the phi is a static, right? But the, but the phi is actually depending on the uh, ratio of the existing assets in the liquidity so pool. So that's actually a little bit the the RIs. So the okay. RIs uh, like can change across the transaction. This is only for a single transaction that you're executing right now yeah, with the data the model, available. Is there a, can I suggest, can we take more of this offline? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Gather, and I saw a couple more hands. Oh, cool. So do you want to take the gather yeah. question first? Uh, so how does, uh, sorry, okay. Uh, for regular applications of the t equals zero example, you need to use flashlights or have some, so that's actually correct, yeah. So I did not talk about how to actually execute these, um, you know, kind of this optimal tr trade sequence. Uh, that's discussed a little bit in the paper, but it's actually, it's, it's an important issue. Um, usually, actually, the way they're executed is by solving some flow type uh, problem, but you can do it. It's, a, it's surprisingly easy, but it depends also on the semantics of the blockchain, which is why we don't actually discuss them in this paper. In some blockchains, you have flash flows, in some objects, in some you might not. You might have other things. So we we kind of punted it to a second paper, uh, and then okay, we'll take one more. Uh, sure. Thank you. And so, what's one in order to think about like platforms like Coinbase, and Binance? Like, I guess they use like classic order books. That's uh, right. So I was wondering if they can like. Because they might want to do like a smarter routing 
So, right. so you, you can, right? So order books are essentially piecewise linear CFMMs at a fixed, so at a fixed time. Oh, I see. Uh, so, so that's right. So you, they would just be another fee Right. So, uh, but, but it does have to be fixed. This is a really important point is that the reserves are fixed and the current state is fixed, uh, which is not always true in order books. There's weird cancellation stuff that happens. Okay, I think that's the yeah. last question I could take. Cool. So, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. And then um, uh, Nikolaj will give 